Give me land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country. And for those of you who don't know, that's Bing Crosby. He's almost my age. Bing Crosby and the Andrews sisters were my heroes and heroines in about 19, late 1940s. I lived in rural New South Wales, and that was the theme song that I'd go riding my pony with my father, Don't Fence Me In. And when I published my memoirs in 1999, I called it Don't Fence Me In, because I wanted people to understand that I hate other people defining who I am and what I do. I like my own definition, and I want to write my own story. But it's also a story of many thousands of women I've worked with over the years. And I wanted to use the term personal as political because when I started a personal political life, it wasn't a phrase that was in currency. It was first coined in 19, 1969 by a woman called Carol Hanisch. And she was a New York women's liberation activist. And she was complaining about the fact that everything that mattered in the personal lives of women was not seen as proper political business. And that's what she wanted to change. And she decided that if she, could write, if she could use that as a metaphor for the change that was happening in various women's activities in New York, and in 1969, New York was buzzing with women's issues, that would be a great legacy. It's one of the most popular phrases in the world. You could equally say, private is public. Because what we're looking at is what inspires change. And so what I wanted to tell you a little bit about as I've had a pretty big footprint in Australian life, I want to tell you a little bit about how my journey of change happened and why I felt compelled to do it and why I still think that personal political is the way to identify the things that matter in our community. I was born in 1941, do the maths, I'm 74, and I was born into a family who lived in rural New South Wales. There were seven million Australians at the time. And in my family, we believed in Menzies and the Queen and the Women's Weekly. <laughs> my mother loved the fashions in the Women's Weekly and she loved the princesses, who, of course, Elizabeth became the Queen. I even went to the, the visiting of the Queen in the 1950s. And in that family, there were no... Women did not have a voice. They had a domestic voice, and things of domestic interest and concern to them were not seen as economic issues, they weren't seen as political issues, they weren't seen really as much other than women's stuff. My mother accepted that, and my father did the thinking for the family. And that seemed okay at the time, and I went to a little one-teacher school, um, rode my pony, all by myself, off to three miles away to school. And I had this lovely education. I was always the only one in my class and I always came first. <laughs> and I got used to it. I thought this is a great spot to be. But at 11, when I went to high school, things started to change. I had to fight and find my own way through and learn to live my life a little differently. And because there were no schools near me, I had to board in the local town and go to school there. Flick the switch, I went to Armadale University I had a scholarship to school and I had a scholarship to university. And suddenly, I'm 20 years old and in my, I'm in my first classroom. And eight of the students in my first class were 18 and I'm 20. I pretty well thought I knew everything then and I loved the classroom. But actually, it was a city school, an all-girls school, and I didn't know very much at all. And many of the girls were girls from Hungary, after the revolution in, in the um, 50s, and Eastern Europe generally. And their parents had a very different view about the professionalism of a teacher to the way the school saw it. We were a very closed society. No one in my family had ever been to university. No one had ever been out of the country. My father in the war got us you know, to the top of Australia. But that was it. But we still called England home although no one had ever been there. So 
At school, I was a very, as I was a ha the happiest school teacher ever. And I did the perfect thing. After three years, I got married. And I had a bond. And in those days, you had a bond. You, as a teacher, you signed up for five years. And at the end of three years, if you were female, you could waive the bond. And I thought this was fantastic. But you know, age brings some insights. The men couldn't waive their bond. And I thought, fabulous to be a girl. But the truth is, they were preparing us for a job, not a career. And 10 years later, you realise that actually what happened is seniority was the only way to get promoted. And people like me who got married, went on a boat to England, quaint, isn't it, you know? You go by, you go by planes or you go by electronic mail. But we went on a boat and it took six weeks. And so I realised when I came back, three years later, teaching in England, time of the Beatles, Carnaby Street, Washington marches when I worked and lived in Pittsburgh. When I came back, I was a very different person and I was about to have my first baby. And so I went looking around for an obstetrician who would, in, who would encourage me to do birth to the way I wanted to, preferably no drugs with my husband present. I'd seen people doing this in London and the US, but I'd seen different constructs of women. So I eventually found someone and he said, the first obstetrician said, I just like my girls to lie back and you know, I'll give them a bit of a shot and they wake up in the morning and they've got a baby. And I thought, really? I don't think so. I think there might be a bit, it's not called labour for nothing. <laughs> I think it might mean you have to work a bit getting this baby out. Anyway, I went to another obstetrician. He said, you're a perfect candidate for the Childbirth Education Association. Now, I have to say that at this stage, apart from being a member of the History Teachers Association, I had never joined anything. I was not a joiner, I was a very personal, you know, aiming to be a perfect wife and, and mother. So I joined this organisation. I was immediately reviled by my friends who said, you know, what sort of kinky stuff are you doing that you want a husband to see you there? You know, you'll never have sex again, for God's sake. <laughs> go, well, you know, too bad. We'll just have one baby. <laughs> so, well, he came, we had sex again. We had three babies in five years. But what did I learn from that? I learned to birth the way I wanted to, I had to be political. The story had to go into the public arena. There's a power system in hospitals. I still work with it as a chair of Headspace. I had to say, I had to confront people in a, and find allies and buddies to do it with me. The friends I'd left behind three years ago, almost none of them came with me. Those friends disappeared more or less my life. What happened though in those, in that time, we, we filmed people, Channel 10 did the first vaginal birth delivery. My mother didn't speak to me for six months. It was only a fluke, it wasn't mine. I was furious because my baby came a day later. Never on time, that girl. And still the same. And I thought, I learnt about public lies. I learnt about what doctors said about you know, we never tie the tubes of people here. Well, we did. We never let, you know, we don't just lie down and go to sleep and wake up with a baby. That man had a 10-year university education. He should have known better. And I learnt about how to challenge power. And in a sense, and because I know sex is a very high currency in this um, wide for wonder, and we are talking from the inside out, I thought I should tell you that I tried to teach but it was very hard because with a baby there was no maternity leave and I'd lost all my seniority because I'd been a naughty girl and gone and worked in the US and the UK and got other experience. And so I decided I'd go and get a job with family planning. And I'd come to that because I realised with childbirth education that actually what we were talking about was not just Wendy's choice of how to birth, we're talking about reproductive rights. And that, that lesson, from there, childbirth became abortion law reform. Will you choose when you'll birth or whether you'll birth? It became adoption issues. If you can't have access to contraception and you choose not to abort, 
As a single woman, you were not, there was no benefit for you, none whatsoever, no single child benefit until Gough Whitlam. And so you didn't have an opportunity. Most people had very few choices. And I decided that I was going to find a way to lead a life of that. These were all seen as personal issues. Men found them rather distasteful and slightly messy, and I can see from some of the body language here today that that hasn't changed entirely. <laughs> um, I've got a better view than you. And I think that during that time, we learnt that actually we're talking about human rights. Because during that time, the United Nations made family planning a human right. I was also setting up a group with a group of women, a thing called the Women's Electoral Lobby. And we wanted to qu quiz every single man person and female, man and woman, before the federal election to see what they thought about women. Where did women fit into Australian society? And I, met, I went to one where we asked the member for Benelong, before John Howard, and we said, what do you think a woman's greatest attribute could be? Oh, he said, that's easy. Well, we'd interviewed about, you know, 40 by then who'd said lofty things or otherwise. We said, oh, God, what is it? And he said, her virginity. <laughs> now, those of us who didn't have that any longer <laughs> were seriously worried about our residual value to the Australia <laughs> and thought, hmm. So we published it. We published it all over the papers in 1972, before the election, and said, don't vote for people who don't understand what's the difference between a woman's issue and a proper political issue. This is not about personal choice. And when we had the babies, where could they go if we wanted to go to work, if we could find a job? No childcare. On the north shore of Sydney, I live in McMahon's Point, there were three kindergartens between um, McMahon's Point and St Ives that you would put a small person in. There may have been 25 otherwise. So all of those things were happening. And during that time, it always seems amazing to me now, I basically had the name as a sex activist feminist. And I remember I was at that stage also writing the Cleo sex advice column, which my children think is my finest achievement. <laughs> 10 years of that, got the first copies of Cleo in the street. The whole street came until somebody's mother said, I don't think that's very nice to read. And they, but they'd say, your mother knows that. <laughs> so I wanted to just put those things into the sort of context of what it is when you transfer what people think of you personally into a political issue. I laugh now when people say someone's having their first baby. If the whole extended bloody family doesn't go, there's something wrong with you. To think we had to fight to get one man in. They'll faint, they'll do this, they're so hopeless. They weren't. Labor, for me, well, not exactly fun, it was exhilarating and it was wonderful to have my husband there. And so, flick the switch. Education became a political issue. My, in my cohort, 3% of women graduated from university. You know, that's only 50 years ago. And Gough Whitlam said, OK, you feminists, you, you're always causing us trouble. Go and set up girls' school and society and see if we can keep girls at school longer. In today's world, Australian women are there. We are 56% of graduates, in, university graduates in Australia, and we're at the top of the OECD. We won't go down where we are in leadership, but I'll just tell you we're number 26. <laughs> um, so education became important. The next thing, and, and that again, had to be changed. It wasn't just about someone saying, as they did in those days, because we apologised for ourselves, look, I know I've got a medical degree, but it means I'm a better mother. Well, you actually don't need a medical degree to be a mother. It comes as a surprise to people. So what I want to do is just flick us to where we are now, about where personal and political issues might be. And I do think I'd like to say that I think Rosie Batty is the perfect example of someone who has right in this time frame to help you just understand how important it is that you don't trivialise personal things. They're not some little idea that we've had. Rosie Batty has stood up and exposed herself to a world where being 
and taking into every, really taking into every sitting room in Australia the scourge and horror of domestic violence. Now, the scary thing about these issues and the Sexual Abuse Crimes Commission is all of these things we are told as women, don't tell, keep it a secret. And it's only as the bravest, and I'm not putting myself in that category, as the bravest people expose themselves that you get it to be dealt with at a political level. I think Liz Broderick's, one of her great achievements as Sex Discrimination Commissioner, has been to make domestic violence a workplace issue. To get workplaces to understand that people who come battered, broken, bruised, work is a very safe and important place to be and it's better for them to be there, but they need some extra support. And I think about the time when 25 of us put an ad in the Nation Review, which was a very popular sort of left-wing political paper, in 72, and we published our names and said, we've all had illegal abortions. Come and, um, come and arrest us. My mother didn't speak to me for another six weeks. <laughs> Um, however, no one was there. No one came to arrest us. No one knocked on our door. Because by then, we had the ultimate thing, and that is voice. And I wanted you to see... Hmm, I hope it's going to work. Yes. This is my, one of my favourite cartoons. It's a very old-fashioned punch cartoon. Can you see it? OK. Yes? Miss Triggs, I grew up in a world where when a woman said something, a man had to repeat it in order for it to be authoritative. When I was the deputy chair of the ABC, I said to um, the director of television, could you tell me why there are no women read the news? I became the deputy chair in 1983 and no two women had read the news as a fill-in. It, it seems incredible to you, doesn't it? You could not believe. And he said, it's very clear, women don't have authoritative voices. So we've, we've morphed our personal voice into a political voice and gained authority and respect on the way. We don't have to ask someone else to paraphrase it for us anymore. Ms Triggs is, is not going to be concerned. And I want to leave you with the last political personal issue, and that is marriage equality. If gay people had not spoken out, if gay people had been kept in the closet, if they had not used their voices, and in family planning there were a lot of gay people there because it was the only place that you could talk about sex and sexuality, if gay people hadn't been able to use their voices, we would not be having this debate now. It's another classic private, public, personal, political. And I would say to you, as I finish, that one of the most interesting things is if you're not persistent in pursuing equality and respect for people with difference, if you're not respectful the inst and intentional in your language, actually the system defaults back to being exclusive. To be an inclusive society is a great aspiration. And to be able to use your voice publicly and politically is an important thing to do. I hope you'll use yours and I hope that you'll enjoy the opportunity to flex your voice muscles and don't wait for Miss Triggs or if we reversed it, Wendy McCarthy to make that story for you. Thank you.